So everybody, welcome to this uh, teaching session. It's it's an honor and a privilege to introduce my dear friend, Dr. Harish Mitran. Dr. Harish Mitran is a consultant thoracic surgeon at National University Hospital, Singapore. He's one of the rising stars of thoracic surgery, and we meet quite often on the international circuit when we are uh, lecturing, uh, particularly in, in all parts of Asia. Uh, in fact, I was with Harish last weekend in Bangkok, where uh, we were running an ATAP course. Uh, Dr. Harish, uh, thank you very much for giving us the time. Uh, we really appreciate your effort, and the floor is all yours. Please take it away. Uh, it's a pleasure, uh, Dr. Khan. Thank you so much for having me over. Um, uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, you know, I know it's 5:30 in the in, in in the evening. Then I guess you guys are uh, just out of work. So uh, my discussion today is basically chest wall tumors, uh, or my lecture today is chest wall tumors. And I wanted to actually start this discussion. We'll start with a little bit of theory. We'll go on to the basics of it. Uh, but I haven't gone in depth to about each type of chest wall tumor because you can get that from textbooks. And, uh, but what's important is how we manage the patients as consultants and how we actually deal with it, at least within my system here in Singapore. So, um, uh, all right, so here we go. So what is a chest wall tumor? So basics is basically anything on the chest. So you can see it starts off with the skin, the soft tissue, where if you go down deeper, the muscle, the cartilage, the bone, and everything else basically as a system, it all interacts with each other. And anything that grows within the, the chest, except for the breast, basically is, is, uh, is a chest wall tumor. It's how we categorize the chest wall tumor. So uh, how do we classify it? Basically, basics. Uh, one can be a primary and one can be a secondary. Fine. So uh, primary chest wall tumors journey you know, account for about only about 2% of total tumors in the whole body. And um, less than half of them are actually primary chest wall tumors. Out of that, if you find a chest wall tumor, approximately 55% of them basically um, uh, are tumors that basically either origin from either the bone or the cartilage. And the remaining 45% basically are from soft tissue. And what are the risk factors for developing chest wall tumors? Even when people always say, it's a prior trauma, previous radiation. Tra trauma can be like um, uh, chondromas or chondrosarcomas or previous radiation osteosarc is known to actually develop from that before. Uh, but in general, you know, whenever you, you, you see a chest wall tumor, I think most of them are actually basically genetic mutation that actually develop. So, uh, you know, you know I, in, in the chest wall, basically about 85% of them actually originate from the ribs and about 15% actually come from the sternum. So most of the chest wall lesions that you see, even if it's anteriorly, most of them actually arise from the ribs. And if you see a chest wall tumor, basically in an adult, you know, you can debate whether it's benign or malignant from a, just a clinical perspective. But when it's a child, most of the time, it's actually a malignant lesion. So secondary chest wall tumors, you know, I think this is one very common. We always see this in our lung tumor boards, uh, at least in surgery. And uh, we know metastasis can always come from many areas. It can come from hematogenous spread, it can come from lymphatic spread, it can come from the lung, come from mediastinum, pleura, and direct invasion, you know, breast cancer is the most common that you see involving the chest and as well as lung cancer. So basic outline, primary tumors, benign or malignant. Again, you can divide them from soft tissue and soft tissue tumors basically can be benign or malignant. Uh, you know, the list, I, I think I don't need to read out this list, uh, it's, it's all there. Uh, and then bone, cart bone and cartilage, as you go deeper in, the benign lesions. Now, these are the ones that I'll discuss a bit more in depth. Uh, benign lesions can be fibrous dysplasia, which I actually commonly see here in Singapore. Uh, osteochondromas, chondromas, and then leg hand cell histiocytosis. And melanin, of course, the dreaded osteosarcoma and chondrosarcoma. And even sarcoma, really... In, in my practice, I don't do children, so many I don't see very much of it, but it's one of the, the, uh, the points out there that are very common uh, lesions in the, in the chest. Secondary tumors, of course, dark invasion or from mats. And so clinical features, when, when we see a patient, I think we've got to go back. Most of you all are actually either consultants already or, or, or registrars or residents. Taking. So you need to take a careful history. Uh, most of them basically are in, asymptomatic. And, uh, you know, when they come and present to us, most of the time they say, look, they've got a swelling here. And a lot of my patients, they say, oh, just a lump. Uh, it's been growing slowly. 
you know, and uh, you've got to take a, a thorough history of how, how fast it's grown, when did they feel it, uh, and then is there any pain and, you know, constitu constitutional symptoms are probably the most common thing, you know, loss of weight, loss of appetite, uh, night sweats, fever, uh, out for these things and look at and ask these questions. Now, the hit, from history taking, the points to note that, and you got to keep this in your head most of the time, that majority of chest wall tumors are metastasis, all right, or they come from direct invasion from surrounding tissue. And primary chest wall tumors, if they are, are generally slow growing, and they are 75% of them are painless. So if they're fast growing and they start to having pain, they're mainly because they're cancerous. Why? Because rapid expansion, it kind of stretches the cortex, unless it even breaks the cortex, so it actually hurts them a lot. So they'll come to you with pain over there. So of course, we got to ask things like age because it's bimodal distribution in, in the type of cancers. We got to ask about associated diseases, associated weight loss, previous mass of cancers. You want to know if they've had a cancer from somewhere else before it could be met to the, to the ribs. So you got to watch out for that. Basic physical, physical examinations, what we do from med school, they teach you about you know, firm, tender, mobile, not mobile. And again, I won't go into detail there. And again, the word here is if it's rapidly growing, you have to cue that it is actually a malignant lesion. All right, and ask about trauma is very important. Okay, so once you do the investigations, they come to you, what do you do next? So I always ask my registrars one question. So patient sitting on your table right now, uh, sitting on, on your, chair, your chair in your consultation room, so what are you gonna do next? So the first thing you go is, okay, it's a chest wall lesion, the fastest thing you probably can get on the spot is a chest x-ray. So you write the chest x-ray, you can order it online, send them for a chest x-ray and bring them back. And chest x-ray actually, you can see most of uh, any obvious gross lesions on chest x-ray. But that is actually really not diagnostic because we all know that we've got a lot of new best images out there that gives a very clear delineation of things. CT thorax is my favorite thing. I can read CT thorax and as a thoracic surgeon, it's important that you read a CT thorax better than the radiologist. You have to know it very well inside because it takes a big role on your planning. You need to know how to plan your surgery and CT thorax actually can manage that. MRI scan. Sorry, that's my dog. Compass, hold on. Inside. Sorry about that. Hold on a second. Sir. That adds to the excitement of the lecture. <laughs> I apologize. Sir. Okay, so MRIs are, are, are really good because they actually really show you exactly what, what, what's the interaction with uh, bone scans and PET scans. So I'll go into a little bit more detail right now. So most of the tumors in the ribs you can see on x-ray like I mentioned to you. Um, an example is over here. This is an obvious lytic lesion over here in the bone. Uh, they can be associated with bony erosions. You, know, you can either probably see lung mats if they are there in the lung fields. Middle-style lymph nodes, again, difficult to tell, but if the highlight area is very padded and compact and very solid looking, you might tend to worry about those things. All right, CT thorax, again, like I mentioned to you, this is actually the scan that you need to know inside out as a thoracic surgeon. Now, you can see so many things and you can actually plan your operation without any other um, investigation uh, from a surgical point of view about CT thorax. So you can see everything. You can see the extent of the involvement of the lesion. You can see the spread. You can see if there's any meds. You can look for lymph nodes from there. You can look at soft tissue invasion, um, a bone invasion, and, um, and, uh, and, and, and um, every, every other structure around there. Now, what is actually very good nowadays is we've got 3D recon. So 3D recon is something when you have a chest wall tumor, it's not only very cool to look at, it's actually very nice to see a planning structure. You can tell your radiologist or your radiographer that, look, I want to see just the rib cage minus the scapula of that, or I want the scapula on board to plan my surgery a bit better. So 3D, 3D recon is actually something very, very good, but it's not diagnostic. It's mainly for surgical planning. All right, MRI scans. Now, these guys, are, I would say, for me, very important if the tumors are very high up, first rib, second rib, or, or posterior tumors. Now, why is that? If you look at this diagram here, it's one of our patients, he had actually osteosarcoma. And looking at, yeah, there was some involvement of the transverse process and stuff, but you know, we don't know if it's in, actually involving the body of the vertebra, we weren't sure. But when actually you do an MRI scan, now you look down here on the MRI, it really tells you the, the 
extent of the invasion. And uh, this is when you actually get your colleagues who are spine surgeons or uh, orthopedic surgeons, or if you're dealing high up in the brachial plexus area, you call your hand surgeons to come in and assist you uh, in the surgery because it's no point tackling things uh, that are way beyond your reach because uh, as, uh, as, as thoracic surgeons, 80 or 90% of our work actually we deal within the thoracic cavity. When it gets to the spine, it's, you know, don't take it on because these cases you see probably maybe five, or at least in my practice, you know, you see maybe about three or four a year. And it's something where, you know, you want to get the experts to get the best outcome for the patient. Bone scan, PET scan, I think it just explains itself. PET scan is a functional scan. It gives you a whole overlook of the whole body. And uh, bone scan is actually good uh, to actually identify any other lesions anywhere else within the uh, thoracic cavity or anywhere else uh, if there's any bone mass. So once you've done all your scans, uh, what's our next phase? Our next phase is to get tissue biopsy. Now, most of the time when it comes to rib lesions, um, we want a core biopsy. You don't want to just bite on the cortex surface. You want to get into the medullary cavity, get the tissue there and come out. But whatever said and done, the core biopsy is actually very, very small. And a lot of times, and, and I've actually stopped ordering core biopsies unless it's very, very obvious or it looks very soft or very malignant. Because I think to make an actual decision, if the lesion is small, uh, also if the lesion is very large, more than five centimeters, I actually go in and do an incisional biopsy. And when you do an incisional biopsy, what you want to do is you want to not just bite on the cortex of the rib. You want to break the cortex and you want to get into the medulla and take the tissue from there and send it off because that will actually really give you a good uh, proper diagnosis. If it's a small lesion or, or under five centimeters, you can actually go in and resect the whole thing out. But you must tell your patient, this, if it turns out to be something malignant, I'm going to have to go in again and do a, a, a wider resection for them. That's very important. So in my practice here, or at least in Singapore, we've been trained to educate our patients. Never ever say that, oh, it can be done straightforward and then, and then don't follow up. The most important thing is you must educate and tell your patients. You're not there to scare them, but you're there to educate them. All right. And when you perform this biopsy, you got to plan for your future. Understand that if there's a melanin potential, you segment when you're doing an open biopsy, you want to make sure you're tracked and you must direct your, your, you must plan your surgery knowing very well it's in the right track. Now, most of the time, within two weeks, we go in again and we, if we do an open biopsy within two weeks, we go in there so the wound's still fresh, it's still fresh in your mind. But if you, if someone else is going to do the surgery for you in different systems, you must document this exactly, your point of entry, how you go in, what tissue you went through and uh, tell them that because when they do things, they need to cut everything out and take it as an end block piece. All right, so principles of management, basically, uh, back to it, we got to work the patient up, get a histological diagnosis, and I never make decisions on my own nowadays. MDT is the biggest thing right now. I think every one of y'all should work within your hospital um, unit uh, to talk with your oncologist, to talk with the plastic surgeons, the spine surgeon, if it's a posterior lesion, talk together, because when you talk together and discuss together and work together, that's when you actually get the best outcome for the patient. Okay. So right before you go in for surgery, basic workup, make sure they're fit for surgery. Make sure they can, uh, they have a good uh, heart, they have a good lung function test. They're not, you know, uh, very skinny. They're not uh, all then, you know, they have a good nutritional status, okay? Always keep in mind, very important, it's no point doing a chest wall resection or for the fact any resection if you're going to do an R1 resection. You've got to plan and make sure that I'm going to get tumor clearance because you have done injustice to the patient in chest wall surgery, especially if you're going to do an R1 resection. Debulking surgery for chest wall doesn't work. All right? Always have a multidisciplinary approach and um, assess. Sometimes you get a single lesion, which is a met. You've got to talk to your primary team. Make sure that uh, you know, we can actually resect that single met. So I'm going to focus on the theory part of five main lesions. And I think this is what you probably mostly will encounter from a surgeon's point of view. From the benign point of view, it's going to be osteochondroma, uh, chondromas, and fibrous dysplasia, and uh, malignant tumors, basically chondrosarcs and uh, osteosarcs. Okay. So osteochondroma basically is the most benign tumor you should probably encounter in a chest wall. They count, count about 50% of all the rib tumors. 
and they come from the metaphyseal cortex of the rib. Okay, and they usually consist of both the bone and the cartilage. And of course, you know, men we are the men are the ones that actually get most of these years all the time. Okay, so they usually are single, uh, singular. Uh, they are long-standing. They're painless. The patients come to you and say, hey, "Dog, you know, I've got this bump, X-ray. There's something there." Or maybe just been there for so long, their wife pushed them and said, "Look, I'll come and do a check." Or, you know, and they, and they and you find these out. So most of the time, you actually pick these guys up incidentally. All right, but if you get multiple osteochondromas, then you you want to make sure that they're not part of some familial condition, and uh, this thing called multiple exotosis. Rare. I've not seen this before. This is from theory. Okay, so look at this. Uh, this view okay so on chondromas and osteochondromas basically are pedunculated they are sessile and uh, they usually have a cartilages cap over it now these are bigger ones over here and uh, they actually have a thin calcified rim and sometimes you can see a, cart uh, a cartilage having said that when these tumors are very very large like this you know and although radiologically you may if it's a small one you can go in and resect it if it's a large one again you got to go back to your basics big tumor you know either you go you're going to tell your patient i'm going to take it out and then come back and be resect further or you want to do a biopsy first and i always really suggest do a biopsy first okay so what's the prognosis it's very good uh, in the literature probably less than one percent become malignant and uh if it's a child uh you don't do anything you leave it watch it an elder person or an adult, basically, I'll go in and, uh, and cut it out. All right, next is fibrous dysplasia, another very common one. Uh, basically, they grow outwards. So they push the cortex and it stretches the cortex. Okay, and so when it starts stretching the cortex, basically, they actually become a bit tender. All right, and they can cause pathological fractures. Again, discovered incidentally when they do workups or chest x-ray, when they're going to go to work, they find this lesion over there. So here's a patient, uh, one of my patients, a 32-year-old male, uh, fibrous dysplasia, very large. You can see a very steady growth. It's expansile, it's growing outwards. He actually came in because of pain. Because And why is that so? Is because as this thing gets larger, it starts rubbing on the other rib. So whenever they breathe and stuff, they get a bit of pain. It hits on the nerve a little bit, it rubs the bone. So they have a bit of pain, and, and, and that's how he presented to me. Now, chondromas, uh, chondromas and chondrosarcomas kind of go together. Now, these guys basically come from the cartilage. So they, most of the time, they're always very anterior. You've got you to gotta think about that. They're very slow growing, they're painless, and uh, they come with a lump most of the time. But just because they're benign in the chondromas, they always recommend a wide resection. And why is that so? Because when they take the histological sample, if you do a, just a core biopsy or a small resection, they can never actually tell from a small biopsy, whether it actually has a sarcomatous component within it, all right? So chondrosarcomas basically is probably the most common uh, primary osseous tumor of the chest wall. It resembles the chondroma, all right? And again, they come from the front, so they're very close to the, the sternocostal junction over here, all right? So in Mayo Clinic, uh, I, I pulled up this paper. This is done in the 1990s, uh, and of all their chondrosarcs, they found out 12.5% of these patients were associated with trauma, so they, they kind of linked it and said, oh, maybe trauma can precipitate a chondrosac. Okay, so again, it affects men more than women, and uh, they're not very aggressive, but what you want to do is, from a surgery point of view, you always want to get a wide resection because you got to treat it like a cancer. And I'll come to talking about wide resection after this. So here's an example of a chondroma or a chondrosac. We don't know. We don't know. So if you're going to go in there, do a wide resection, and, and think of these now. Or you can do a minimal resection, a small resection, and then tell your patient you're going to come back in and, and do the a repeat if it turns out to be cancer. Okay, so prognosis uh, again, you probably can read this. Uh, the overall survival basically, if it's a chondrosarc, is 64% at five years and 53% at 10 years. Okay, so osteosarc is, is probably one of our most deadliest uh, tumors. It's very, very aggressive. Um, it usually happens in, in the young adulthood and also it's a bimodal distribution so it happens a bit later on in life also. Generally it happens all in the pelvis, in the long bones of the leg. It can present sometimes in the, in the, um, in the rib cage but again uh, this part is a bit rare. Most and if they have an osteosarc within the, um, within the, the long bones, generally they come to you 
mats in the chest. Very important if it's a single, multiple, or two mats or three mats, go and take it out. It actually prolongs their life very well if it's in the lung. Sorry. Uh, you know, and if it's within just a singular, within the rib cage, again, go in and take it out. So if it happens primarily in the chest, basically, they grow very fast. So it becomes painful, like I mentioned to you. Uh, and um, you, know, you can do a blood test. You can see the race ALP. And uh, you must always do PET scan to rule everything out to make sure you've got no meds anywhere else. Okay? Uh, classical appearance, I think we all have to know two, two common things, right? Sunburst appearance is the common uh, name uh, that examiners will always want to ask you. If you see an osteosarc, what's that classical radiological appearance? The sunburst appearance. And earring sarcoma is the onion ring appearance. Uh, this will just tick off the boxes when you go for exam straight away. And they, so they know roughly, you know some basic theory behind that, all right? Uh, again, back to square one, when you do a scan, get the CT and get the MRI. Treatment and prognosis, um, same process, wide local resection, you want to get margins. Um, uh, previously, osteosarc had very, very few, and a lot of papers from the past, and if you see a lot of chest wall papers, they're actually very, very old. Right, so the, the, you know, they said they had very poor prognosis, but a paper from China I pulled up in 2015, they had 50 patients who had a new adjuvant chemo, then followed by resection, and then radiotherapy, and they had basically a 78% 70, survival uh, at five years. So, so I, I think uh, that's amazing if uh, you look at uh, um, how medicine has progressed in its past 10, 15 years. All right, so again, stage them, watch out for pulmonary meds, and of course, like I said, we do induction chemotherapy followed by white local resection. And uh, then you can give RT or follow up by a new, uh, by given chemo. Okay. So I just put that as the basic theory in examinations. And most of the time, if you have patients and stuff, these are the general cases you'll get within your, your, your scope of range. Okay. So once you get through that basic theory exam, which you'll probably in, in, a, in an FRCS exam or in a, in a, post-grad exam, we don't want to know like a medical student part of it. We want to get down straight to business. We want to know as a consultant, how do you manage this patient? All right. So when you think, okay, I'll just resect the tumor, you know, if it's big, I'll take it out and stuff. And so when I was a, a resident, the word um, chest wall reconstruction is a very, very big word. And everyone thinks, wow, we do so many amazing things as a chest wall reconstructor. But in reality, uh, chest wall surgery is probably one of the easiest operations and one of the fastest operations and one of the safest operations to perform. And when you get, you, once you cut or you take the tumor out, the most important thing is you've got to have planning. You've got to know how to reconstruct the chest wall. Now, it's important if you haven't done many of this or you don't have the right equipment in your center, you need to refer it off to a bigger center. Uh, that has to be very, very clear with every surgeon. Our responsibility is not to ourselves, but our responsibility is to our patient. So, you know, small tumors, you attack it. Big tumors, if you feel you're not comfortable, send it to a bigger center that's done more. And what you do if you go with them, with the patient, you do the surgery, follow up with them, watch how they do it. And then after two or three times you've seen it, you can probably do it yourself, right? Very important when you do chest wall resection is, R0 resection, very, very important because if you look at the, the evidence behind it, it the, if you leave very, very small margins of back, it's 86% recurrence rate for sarcomas. And if you don't do a proper resection, 96% sometimes, okay? And these guys come back with a vengeance. They come back very, very quickly, all right? So, like I mentioned to you, chest wall resection, margins are the most important thing. If it's a benign lesion, you go with a two centimeter margin. If it's a malignant lesion, now this malignant lesion, four to five centimeters is a paper based on 1986. So 33 years ago, they wrote this paper. And I read the paper. It's actually the patient cohort was from 1955 to 1975. And since then, for 33 years, it's become like the, the grail for us, you know. You must do a four to five centimeter resection margin. You must take the top rib, you must take the bottom rib. And with them, with back then, with, the, with what they showed in this 1955 to 1975, 
they, it doubles their five year survival. Now imagine what you can do with our technology today and with our advancement in medicine today. You can just advance the patient's lives tremendously. All right. When you take things out, take it out as an N block lesion. All right. If there's lung stuck to the bottom, wedge, it, wedge the lung out. If there's per pericardium, cut the pericardium out. All right. If it's sternum, just end block. Take the whole stern up with our, our devices. We have to reconstruct anything. Okay, and of course, if you did a biopsy before, you must include the biopsy track. And this is the same principle I apply for T3 lung cancer tumors when it's invading the ribs. Uh, they always say, oh, two centimeter margin important, but I, I abide by this rule. I always go wide because another two centimeter is really not going to make a difference with our new reconstructed. Uh, that we have. Okay. And um, what about for uh, MET? So we, all know that, um, we all know that if it's. Uh, sorry, I got some interference there. Okay. Um, when it comes with metastatic disease, uh, we all know, okay, if it's a bone mat, don't take it out. But, you know, this is, this is a, a, a theory that is evolving today. Nowadays, when we get mats, if we can resect it, we already know for lung, we've got the basic thing. If the primary lesion is controlled, all right, if, you, if it's a single multiple, but as long as you can resect everything out, they've got enough lung function. Um, and, uh, and, and, and once you take it out, it can prolong their life. We go ahead and take out the mat. So if there's a single bone mat, even another one single bone mat by itself, I will go in and, and, and resect it because again, like I said, with things like immunotherapy and stuff today, uh, you can prolong their life quite well. So after we reset the tumor, how do we reconstruct this space? And very important is that you got to plan your surgery. You don't want to have dead space. And I'll show you a scan after this of what happens when you get dead space. So you want to obliterate dead space. This is common again with lung surgery. The most important thing when you do lobectomies, when you do wedge resections, is you want to obliterate pleural space. Why? Because when you get a pleural space, that's when all your uh, fluid will build up over there again. You can get DPFs, you can get infections, and that will progress. So what you want to do is you want to approximate tissue to tissue, get it to form what we call uh, fibrosis between the layers, and that will seal off everything. Okay? You want to make sure when you resect big chest wall tumors, you want to preserve the pulmonary mechanics. You don't, want to, you don't have to have a flail chest. You want to protect your, your, your organs inside in case somebody falls down or you know, unnecessary someone hits them or what your organs are protected inside. You want to provide good soft tissue coverage. And of course, very important, you see, if you, if you do the surgery, you take everything out and you put a big block of cement over there, how are you going to follow up the patient with just basic chest x-ray? So you must make sure that you actually can get a clear view. And of course, very important is the RT, you must be able to can receive a juven RT after that. Okay, so what are the good materials we use to reconstruct? Very important. They must be rigid. They must abolish the paradoxical movement that you get in like flail. They must be inert and you, you must allow fibrous tissue to grow. The wonderful thing about meshes is that once fibrous tissue grows, it actually hardens in time. It's very difficult to take it out and I'll explain to you why afterwards. All right? But the idea is you want fibrous tissue to grow and that actually has a protective layer and hardens inside. Okay? It must be malleable to shape okay? and it must be radiolucent. All right? Now, so after you've, you've, uh, you've uh, figured out what mesh to use, whatever area you, you have removed or you've cut out, now which area do we reconstruct, all right? So this is the basic theory. Posterior defects, after the fort rib and below, you must reconstruct, all right? So why is that so? Because they get scapula entrapment, all right? If you cut out the first three ribs posteriorly, or even second and third rib, the scapula is a protective barrier over there. It doesn't get lodged behind the rib, but if you cut anything below that, they get a scapular entrapment. That's not good. All anterior defects important. Your heart, your lungs, everything is here. It's important to reconstruct that. More than three ribs, people talk about flail. Uh, if a patient actually has very poor pulmonary function, if you take more than two ribs, you can reconstruct. When you take out the menibrum, this is important. The shoulder girdle, we actually had a long discussion in a few conferences about resecting menibrum and taking out the uh, the uh, sternoclavicular junction and how to reconstruct. This is actually something very difficult to do. And I've not actually done it. Whatever knowledge I have is based on theory. People take the fibula and reconstruct. But the problem is they lose their shoulder function. But if there's a tumor, you got to take it out, you got to take it out. And 
Of course, if you resect the whole sternum, you must reconstruct it. Why? Because you get a flail component. If it's a very small defect, one rib, two ribs, sometimes you can just close it primarily, you'll be fine. Okay, so materials we use, you've got non-rigid, you have rigid, and you've got semi-rigid. Um, you've got all your flaps that you work with your, with your um, plastic surgeon with. Um, I work with them all the time, every time I do big surgery, and you'll see lots of photos after this. Uh, rigid meshes, uh, you got your metal, you can get your, your proline mesh, and you can sandwich it with the bone cement in between. They'll be firm, but what I really, really, really love using is actually our plating system. I don't know whether it's available in India right now. It's expensive. It costs about 700 Singapore dollars per plate. So what's that? That's about maybe about um, 500 or 400 US dollars. Uh, but if you have it, it actually it's brilliant. It actually reconstructs your temple very well. And of course, you got your PTFE and your and your Gore-Tex uh, graph. So meshes basically you got. Vicryl, proline, malax, it's just everything in there. The idea basically is that you want to get, for me, if it's a mesh, I get, I always ask them for the biggest mesh they have. It's 30 by 30. Okay, and what I do is I fold it. I fold it, I fold it. I just use proline switches all around it and create like a, like a small um, sandwich. All right, and then I can place it over there and it's firm and hard. If I feel that's not sufficient, I place bone cement in between it and I sandwich it together. Okay, so what are the benefits of the mesh? Basically, they're easily manipulated. They, you can handle it. You double over it, like I mentioned to you. Fold it over. You fold it until it's a nice thick sandwich, and then you anchor it down. Okay, so advantages again, same thing. They can, they you can be stretched. You can curve it a little bit. Uh, the good thing about it is it's got actually uh, it's like a net, right? So fluid can seep through it up and down. So there's actually seroma build up over there. Sometimes it can flow into it chest cavity or chest drain can drain it all up. So that's a very good thing about it, all right? They're long lasting, they're good, and again, allows for ingrowth of regenerative parenteral tissue. The bad thing is that if this mesh ever, 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 ever gets infected, it is a nightmare because it is a nest of bacteria. Bacteria loves it's a foreign body. So I actually had a patient that I placed a mesh over there, it got infected. I gave him antibiotics, IV, admitted him, and I thought I will try my level best. Hopefully, I can treat it. But I spoke to my ID physician, and 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 uh, she basically told me, you know, I'm dreaming. You gotta go and take it out. It was infected by Pseudomonas, so we went there to take it out. And once you try to take out this mesh, the amount of fibrous tissue it forms with the underlying structures with the lung is actually a real long nightmarish operation. But you gotta get it out because that's the only way to get rid of this uh, infection from them. All right, so this is the bad thing about it. Okay, so here's the one. Here's a nice uh, a CT scan. So this is a patient with a sternal resection done, okay? They place the tram flap over it, and, and this is the, actually a mesh. All right, at the bottom here is actually the mesh. Now, we thought actually it would be permeable, but this mesh looks like it didn't. And what you need to do is, number one, is when you place the mesh over here, you can see the mesh is actually a bit loose. You want to make it nice and taut because when the tram flap or any flap sits on it, you want it to sit right above it. If the mesh is loose and the tram flap sits like this, you're going to have a space. Now, a lot of times, the plastic surgeons keep drains in like forever. They, sometimes they keep drains in for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, you know. And, and, and that's exactly what we did with this patient too. We kept it for a very long time, I think four weeks, and it was dry. Once we took it out, probably some tissue reaction and stuff, this seroma built up. So we place the drain, we drain the fluid, and we're just waiting now. If, if actually it turns out to be uh, infective, then our nightmare starts again. Because this actually can cause mediastinitis. And when you get mediastinitis, it's almost a 50% mortality rate. Okay, so here's an example of less breath cancer, which we performed. We did a stenectomy, you can see. The stenectomy is the sternum has gone. These are the lungs, this is the heart over here, right? And uh, this patient, we placed a mesh in between. We anchored the mesh with ethibone switches. So what we do is actually, you can actually try to go around the rib, but I actually like to just take the drill and just drill a small hole so you can just curve around, hooks it up and tie it down together. So we actually have a good anchor around it and then they get a flap and they put it over. Again, another patient, so this patient had breast cancer 
And uh, this is not an end block resection. So what the surgeon decided was to do is because it's so radiated, he wanted to just get the breast out first. So he just curved everything up, but there's no tumor spillage. And then we, we dissected around. We did a partial stenectomy, you can see here. That's the line there. These are the ribs. So once everything was cut out, the heart, the ribs, partial sternum, and then we placed the mesh over it. Okay. So uh, if you want to take another look, that's how we do it. So we place the mesh. This time it was taut. So you can see we make it taut uh, over here. And it sits on it. it sits on it nicely. So uh, metal macro, uh, sorry, um, bone cement in between the proline mesh, like I mentioned to you. Uh, this is also good to use. I actually started going away from this once I once I started using the plates, but it's something you can use and you you have it. You're at disposable. You you and you don't have the plates. You must actually use this. So we sandwich the bone uh, between, uh, sandwich the bone cement between the, um, between the proline mesh and it gets it a good, nice rigid structure. You can actually mend it. Uh, you've got probably like two minutes to mend it properly before it hardens. And uh, it actually gives a good, strong uh, support. Disadvantage is not permeable to fluids. Uh, because it's so rigid, they say it increases pain. Uh, it can fracture. And of course, if you get infection, 10 or 20% of them can develop an infection in 90 days. And, uh, you know, this 5% rule of removing it, I, you know, we can try. But I think once the mesh, from my past experience, once the mesh gets infected, you got to go and take it out. Okay. So this is a patient. Uh, I think I put up the scan earlier. This is an osteosarc um, over here tumor invading, you can see the body of the vertebra, the um, transverse processes. So uh, the, the spine surgeon uh, resected the roots. Um, he disarticulated the, the rib from the, uh, uh, from the um, uh, costal vertebral uh, angle. And then I did the uh, posterior thoracotomy, resected all the tumor. Then we put a flap. So here's the, this is the patient lying in prone position. A uh, tumor sitting behind here. Uh, the orthopedic surgeon or the spine surgeon um, did the resection of this part. He disarticulated and dislocated it for me. And over here, this view you can see here um, is all cut out. And this is the final final outcome once the tumor is out. So we raise the flaps. We've got a big gap over here. Now I can't use plates over here because I can't implant it onto the spine. Now when we do spine uh, when we do posterior fractures in trauma. We actually can implant the, the matrix strip or, or the plate onto the transverse process. But once the transverse process is gone, you have no room to do that. So we did bone cement for this gentleman. Uh, we proline mesh and bone cement, anchor it all down, put the flaps over and closed it. Now, this is the outcome CD scan. You can see this is the bone cement over here. Can you see my arrow? Um, it's extending even past the spinous process over here. Now, I like to show not the best of my surgeries, but I like to show things that everyone can learn. Now, this gentleman, young man, is 38 years old. After the surgery, he had backache for one year. He was probably about 90 kilos uh, in weight. Uh, after a year, his weight was down to about maybe 70 or 69 kilos. And just because he couldn't sleep, he just his backache hurt him so much. And why? Because we didn't plan, we, we placed the, we thought, okay, they'll be devoid of fibers, but this, um, uh, bone cement was actually scratching on the spinous process and it hurt him a lot. So we said, okay, after a year, we've tried gabapentin, we've tried all the pain meds, all the injections didn't work. So we went in there and we cut, we actually went in there. It's a very straightforward surgery. It was easy to do, but it was long because the bone cement is literally cement. When you're taking your, your saw to drill it, it takes a long time to go through. So we cut it out, we got it away from the spinous process and you know what? His pain just disappeared. So very important is that uh, I would like to send this message that listen to your patients, listen to what they are because they live with it and try to accommodate them. Don't think that you're the surgeon, you know better, it can't be so. Uh, it's very humbling uh, to know that I'm wrong and he was right all this time and at least I uh, you know, backed up and went and did that and, and, and helped him and now he's pain free. All right. So uh, osteosynthesis systems, the matrix rib, I think you all have heard. Is it available in India right now? Anybody knows? Yes, it is actually. Okay, excellent. So 
So, uh, used okay, so this system is great. Um, one of the best things uh, that ever probably came to thoracic surgery because it not only fixes your fractures, which is incredible outcome, you re can reconstruct the chest brilliantly. Okay, so it's got a high resistance to corrosion. It's got low weight, uh, it's not heavy. Uh, remarkable resistance to traction. It's compatible with MRI and it's biologically inert. All right. So, uh, uh, it, I, again, I used to use the plates when I resect the, uh, the uh, chest wall. I used to place a mesh under it because you, want, you, you think it's extra support and then prevent lung herniation and stuff. But I actually stopped doing that now because I really don't like the mesh uh, after uh, that one case uh, I got. So, and so when I only reconstruct with the, with, with the plates, I haven't had, I have I had some problems, I'll show it to you after this, but I haven't had problems like bad infection and going in there and try to take everything out again. Okay, so a few complications, of course, uh, uh, plate fracture, bar dislocation, these screws can dislodge, you can fracture the bone. Uh, thankfully, I haven't encountered it because very important when you do rib fixation is you got to implant two cortexes and uh, two tables, drill the screw in properly, get it in, get it to be fixed properly, number one. Number two, make sure you have enough margin. So think of it as if you, if you have two pencils and you wrap it together with cello tape and just the ends are just like that, you can easily break it. But if you bring the pencils closer like that together and you wrap it in the center, it's hard to break. So you must have the three hole. There. They always say the three hole policy. I extend it even further. I put even four holes when I'm reconstructing long defects because it gives that support bilaterally. Now we had again uh, we had this discussion at some con in the, at the chest wall conference and we said, okay, so these these plates eventually will fracture, right? Everything fractures, everything breaks, and what is the worst thing is because long bones you put the plate there, these bones don't move. But in ribs, we are constantly breathing. So there's a constant motion. Eventually, it's going to snap. And why we started using these plates for, for, uh, for cancer was that most of the patients, then we, we, we take them through five years. But with, like I said, with advancement in chemotherapy, immunotherapy, stuff, patients are living longer and longer. So we're actually really yet to see how long these plates can survive. Because I'm pretty sure in about... I remember when I was a medical student, uh, stage four lung cancer lives for under six months. Now you've got stage four lung cancer with immunotherapy living four years, five years. So with technology and involvement in our medicine practice, uh, we're going to see patients living much longer. So this is a true test of time for the, for the plates. All right, so here's another one, uh, chest wall tumor. Uh, I think it was again a breast cancer and uh, resecting the ribs, uh, partial stenectomy done ribs cut out, we place the, the, the uh, plates here. Now, this is the uh, small thing I've sort of just, I'm sure someone else has figured it out too, so I'm probably not the, I'm just uh, what we do. Now, most of the time when we do thoracotomies, we, we uh, put our ethibon sutures around because we cut the intercostal space to get in. And the idea of ethibon sutures is you never ever bring the ribs tight together. That's probably the worst thing you can do for the patient. And I figured out that that's probably why the patient has the most pain post thoracotomy is because what people do is they squeeze the ribs together. When you squeeze the ribs together, what happens? They start rubbing each other and they start forming callus. You're basically refracturing and rubbing bones. So when you bring, the idea of putting the active bone around it is actually to act, just to act as a, like an intercostal muscle while you want to prevent lung herniation. Never ever squeeze the ribs together. That's the worst thing you can do. You just put it there like that and then you just put the active bone and circle it just to prevent lung herniation. So when they do chest wall resection, I do this. I put ethibon in between there, and this is just to prevent lung herniation over here. All right, plastic surgeon comes in, puts the lat dorsi flap over, and then the tram flap over the uh, space here, and this is what the x-ray looks like post op. Okay, so complications of plating. So I want to show you, like I said, uh, another breast cancer post-radiation, uh, breast cancer, post mastectomy, post-radiation. She had a recurrent tumor about eight years later. This is our drawing. I hope you like my drawing on the patient's chest. Reconstructed with the uh, ribs, uh, with the sternal plating system. Tram flap over that. This is the x-ray. Like I said, I extended the plates and, and made it long. Now, we thoracic surgeons, uh, we want to do it fast and quick. Uh, one thing I learned is that you can learn a lot of things from the plastic surgeons. Because they deal a lot with the facial fractures, they actually have to bend the plates 
tremendously precisely to implant it. And so the plastic surgeon was brilliant. They can curve and blend the plates with their malleable bending plates and stuff. And they make it really, really nice. So I've learned from them and I use that now in my practice. So you can learn a lot from your plastic surgeon. So that's what we did. We got three long plates and we placed it over there and the patient was great. So post-op is how it looks like. Uh, we did a surgery in June, in early July, she's great. But so this is where you learn from your practice uh, because she's a very, very skinny, malnourished lady. What happens is in August, two months after the surgery, uh, you can start seeing this area of erythematous start thinning out here in October. And in December, you can see the plate has eroded through over here. Why? Because she's very, very thin. So now this with breast cancer patients, when they're very, very, very thin, I should just put a mesh. Uh, but if they're nice and big and chubby, then I go in and I know the tram flat can cover it properly, I'll then put plates. So what we did was we went in there, we just cut, cut the plate because we don't need that support anymore. All the fibrous tissue has formed. You can see a, a very thickened fibrous tissue all around there protecting the thoracic cavity. Array. So we just cut the plate and it's fine. Unfortunately, one year later, the other plate is eroding through now. All right, so we're going to go in and cut the other one out too. So this is the thing you need to know about plates and, and uh, you plan ahead. And all this is not because it's all just from past experiences doing things and uh, you get these complications and then you figure out, you, you change your practice as you go by. So you must always, always evolve your practice. I always teach everybody, my juniors that, I, I tell my seniors that, my seniors tell me that, you must always, always evolve. Because if you, if any surgeon ever says, this is the best as he can get, then they might as well go and sit on a beach and drink uh, Pepsi Cola. Uh, because uh, I, I never like surgeons who say, no one can do better than this, because then we're never going to evolve. Because the Wright brothers uh, made the first plane, now we got F-35s flying around. So I'm sure they, they never said this could be the best. So very important in medicine and surgery, uh, always, always, learn and you know keep improving keep improving keep improving is very important all right so uh i'm actually sort of done with my presentation i'm gonna go to some case-based uh, uh discussion and uh i'll just run through some stuff and maybe uh, dr khan you can tell me what uh, uh where you feel we should take this lecture to so uh, uh Hari, yeah. i think we've got all these guys online all right. And you open the question to them and we'll ask them to give us an answer as to what is the next step of management. Wonderful. So I'm going to give you the basis. Uh, I, I've been a um, prelude to uh, organizing FRCS exams. And, uh, and I've sat in many of the uh, examinations. And I took an exam myself too. So this is actually a very simple technique. No one wants to know how big or how much knowledge you have about the histology. We want to know very clearly how safe you are as a day one consultant. Okay, that's a very, very important thing here. And so when I assess my residents and we take exams, I want to know not how brilliant they are and tell me 25 different differential diagnoses. I want to know how you handle the case as a surgeon, as a mature surgeon. So here's a simple example. 30-year-old man comes into you with a pain, painless right-sided chest mass that has been slowly growing over five years. So what? So he's in your clinic right now and in examination, what do you wanna, uh, wh how you start? And always think that whatever you do, any exam you sit for, think about it as what are you going to do in your clinic? Exactly what you're gonna do. You just follow that same principles, you apply with flying colors. Okay, so uh, open to the floor. Okay, so I'm going to specifically ask people to come on and, and start answering. So what you've got to do is switch on your microphone and then come on, okay? So let's start off with the Amol. Amol, uh, uh, Dr. Harish has put this case to you. 30-year-old man presents with a painless righteous mass that has been slowly growing over the last five years. He's come to your clinic. What are you going to do? Yes, sir. I will take the detailed history and after that I will order a chest x-ray and uh, 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 I'll, I'll form a list of differential diagnosis. And uh, uh, probably the next thing would be a CT scan uh, to know the position and extent and uh, the spread to the other tissues. 
uh, it looks like a benign mass to me uh, because it is uh, uh, growing very slowly over the last five years. And uh, uh, I will obtain a histology and if uh, it is confirmed that it is benign lesion, then I will try and plan a resection. Okay, and so I, I think I jumped the slides a bit too fast. So I wanted to make this like how we, we teach our residents. So now hypothetically, uh, say it's a five centimeter lesion on the sixth rib. On the left side, we've done a CT scan. Do uh, you think it's relatively benign looking? Uh, it doesn't have any spread anywhere else. It's got an expansile growth. And so what are you going to do now? So now you've got the CT scan. It's back in your clinic two weeks later. You see the CT scan in front of you. What are you going to advise him? Uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a four centimeter lesion. Uh, I will counsel. Uh, I'll I'll talk to the patient and I will explain him uh, to him that uh, he has got a benign lesion. And uh, uh, so can I stop you there? Yes. Can I stop you there? Because yes, sir. yes sir. This is where this is where we go into errors in examination, because. I always tell my patients a CT scan is like a photograph. Yes, sir. All right. You don't know what's inside. So if I give you, I say, what phone is this? Uh, the CT scan will tell me this can be a Samsung, this can be an iPhone, this can be a Huawei phone. Until yes, you open it up, then only you know what's inside. Yes, sir. I would confirm the diagnosis with histology. I, uh, the next step would be the histology. So let me teach you some exam techniques. So you pull up the scan, you say, okay, right now you're 30 years old, you've got an expansile lesion in your, in your uh, rib right now. From the scan appearance, it looks like it's benign. You need to, everything is all about talking and vocalizing. You want to know how you are to convince the patient and make sure that the patient's comfortable with you. It looks like a benign lesion, but I cannot be 100% sure, yeah. all right? Now, there are a few things I can actually propose to you that we can do to get a diagnosis. Yes, sir. Okay. That's how I would handle it. Maybe Dr. Ali will handle it for me. Now, my options are, now go. First, obtain a uh, tissue for histology and yeah, confirm. Say I'm your patient. So talk to me like I'm your patient. Uh, uh, Hello, hi, I, I'm Dr. Amol and I have been uh, seeing your scans and uh, I think you have got a benign uh, uh, lesion on your chest wall, but we need to confirm the diagnosis by obtaining a, a tissue for uh, histology. So uh, the process of obtaining the tissue would be a, a small uh, procedure uh, which involves putting a needle, small needle inside your uh, the lesion and uh, taking out a small piece, which we will uh, see in the microscope and confirm the diagnosis. After that, we can uh, plan our management accordingly. Okay, wonderful. Now, now I'm at the exam and I'm going to turn around and say, okay, wonderful. So you, you will send him for a, for a core biopsy, will you? Yes, sir. Okay, Dr. Amul, what are your other options you have available that you can suggest to this patient? It's uh, a four-centimeter lesion. Uh, Sir, so probably we can get a, a PET scan uh, to know whether it is benign or malignant. No, 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 no. stay to, stay to histology. Okay, so sir. we've already done the scan. So we've done already done because a PET scan is just another scan. Yes, sir. It's another photograph. Think of it that way. So I don't yes, need sir. to take three, four photographs of, of the tomb of the thing. Okay. Uh, that scan is only at the end when you know it's cancer, whatever. Stuff. Yes, sir. You don't uh, go sir. To... Yes, sir. Uh, sir, since the mass is only four centimeter, we can uh, take out the mass completely and then do the histology. Uh, really? That is in incisional biopsy of the mass. No. Excisional biopsy. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Excisional biopsy of the mass. Sorry. sorry sir. Clarify the word that you just used. Excisional, excisional biopsy of the. I heard incisional. I'm not sure. I, yes, in, I, I, in fact, I used the wrong word. <laughs> Sorry, sir. You did say incisional, but the answer is excisional. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. So, so again, now, now let's let's reverse back. So I'm back to me, patient sitting in my clinic. I'm going to show you how we talk to the patient. So, uh, Mr. X and Y, uh, we've seen your CT scan. Look, don't worry so much. You can always calm the patient down. It, to me, it looks like a benign tumor, but I really cannot be 100% sure, all right? We've got two options for you. 
The first option is that I can take you, we can go back to a CT scan room or we can do an ultrasound and the radiologist will do cook, give you some anesthesia, numb that area, put a needle in there and take a core biopsy and they'll give us some answers to what it is. And my other option is as you feel it's maybe bulky there, I can actually go in there, I can make an incision and I can cut that rib out. I won't take too much of the rib, I'll cut the whole rib out and take the whole piece out and I'll send it to the lab. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Once I get the proper history back, if it's a benign tumor, the surgery ends there. We don't do anything. Now, if I yes. get some bad news and it's unfortunate, it's actually a cancer, then what I do is we will need to go in for another operation. I need to get further bigger margins. I need to take the rib above and the rib below and maybe some tissue underneath. Yes, sir. Okay, this is the perfect examination. Oh, I, I, again, I'm not perfect, so someone can probably do better. But this is sort of the uh, answers examiners want to hear. And you got to say confidence. Very important. And I think a lot of times um, uh, we Asians are very afraid to commit. We always, uh, I'm not sure, uh, you need to speak with con. We need to know what you do in the clinic. Because we day one consultant, when... The same patient sits in your clinic. I want to make sure that you're giving him that confidence. That you Excellent. That, that's yes, a very important point that you just made is that this is the FRCS exam because there are four guys on this telecom who are giving the FRCS exams in a couple of months. And the one important factor of the FRCS is that at the end of the exam, the day you pass, you become a day one consultant. So that is why you've got to talk with confidence. And I, I'm so pleased about the way Harish is explaining to you because this is exactly what he would do in his opening. And he's telling you to speak the same language. Don't try to go into flowery language and things like that for the exam. Just speak. Yeah. Speak Get to the point. You have no time to waste. You've got five minutes. You want to tell them I can do this job. I need this, this degree. I need this qualification. I can do this job. You want to convince yep. them. You want to convince your colleagues. You can do the same. Your your future colleagues. You can do the same thing. Okay. Yes. Okay? Sir. Thank you, sir. So yes, so uh, okay. So I, I just I, told I you. Was, this I was going to ask somebody else to come on board. Sure. And give somebody else a chance. So Vinita, do you want to come on board for the yes, side of things? So switch your microphone on. And come on board and take the next question from Dr. Hari. Okay. So, uh, hi, v Vinita. Okay, hi. How are you? Um, may, may I know your 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 level? Fine, sir. Yeah, fine, sir. May I know your level? Sir, in I, I yeah, sir. I've completed my MCH in thoracic surgery, and I'm uh, five years back. I'm working uh, in a private hospital uh, as a consultant okay. thoracic surgeon. Uh, they Wonderful. All thoracic and cardiac cardiac cases, sir. She, okay, she's great. about to go for FRCS exam. So okay, so this is perfect then. This is perfect. So, so I'm going to go to the next question. So uh, what what the examiner is going to go and and you said that okay, um, it's a it's a small the four centimeter lesion. Now, can you explain to the patient and to me what is your approach? So it's a it's a four centimeter lesion on this right sixth rib laterally. Can you explain your approach to me? Uh, sir, is it after getting the histology as a benign or a malignant lesion or do, we no, don't no, need so, no, no, the histology? So the, the, the patient came and said, doctor, cut it out. I don't want to waste time to poke. Just cut it out for me, doctor. So you said, okay, it's a small lesion. I'm going to cut it out. So describe your approach. Okay. So uh, over the sixth rib on the right side, right? Yes. So it's... Uh, I would like to put an incision along the longitudinal, longitudinal on the uh, lesion. So, so very important is nice words. So longitudinal and stuff. It's you want to keep it as simple as possible. So, if say the tumor is there, I would like to make a, a, a parallel incision over the tumor. Okay. okay. Long, I mean, okay, you can use longitudinal. Sorry, uh, maybe I'm a, a bit too plain. But you can say, okay, I'll make a line over the lesion because you don't want to make yeah. lesion two centimeters below right or three centimeters above right you want to be specific yeah. i will make an incision yeah. or longitudinal incision over the tumor over the mass over the lesion all right and then 
What are you going to do next? And then I will, yeah, I will raise the separate the skin and the separate tissue, get to the rib, get to the rib and excise the mass with a two centimeter margin. Okay, wonderful. Now, next question is, when you raise the flap, are you going excise to... Excise the lesion on the rib with a two centimeter margin. Okay, so as you're making the longitudinal incision, you're dissecting <laughs> down, are you going to go onto the cortex before you do the resection? What are you going to do? Are you going to stop short somewhere? Because this is what I, my residents, so they're doing the case right now and they're dissecting the, and then they're burning, burning, burning. Oh boss, I'm here. I see the bone. And I'm going, why did you do that? Right? So you need to be very clear. I'm going to make a skin incision. I'm going to develop the, the, the fat plane. I will raise the flap. Right? Yes. Then, Jenny, you don't want to take, you don't want to burn down up to the cortex because then that may be tumor, right? All right? So yes. you want to take, and the muscle over the, the lateral part, you've got literally nothing that you've got your uh, serratus anterior covering, which you can maybe even take that tissue along with it. Okay? And then you want to get a muscle. So what you want to do is you don't want to burn down up to the cortex. What you want to do is you raise the flap and then I'll palpate the tumor. I will then palpate two centimeters uh, medial, two centimeters lateral, and then I will dissect yes. around the intercostal muscles, and I'll take the risk. Yes. Whether you breach or don't breach the pleura, it really doesn't matter. So my next question is that what happens? So you've done that, you've taken the whole tumor out, it's great, and now you've breached the pleura. Uh, what are you going to do? If I breach the pleura, I will uh, like to put in a small chest drain. Perfect, exactly. All right. And, and you close the lesion primary. Yes, yes. Very nice. So that shows experience, right? Because some people say, I'll just close it now. You breach the pleura, put a chest even, you can take it out tomorrow, no problem, right? I don't know, yes. Dr. Ali, do you, do you, if you breach the pleura, yes. do you uh, put Agreed. a chest even? Agreed. Always. Okay. So we just did that. Okay, so now we go to the next question is uh, now this tumor is. Tens over eight centimeters larger. Who wants to give it a go? Uh, one minute, just let me. Andre, are you on? Andre, do you want to take it on? Unmute your. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Andre. Uh, I think I'm audible now. Yeah, you're audible. Hi, hi, Andre. How are you? Where, where are you from, Andre? Uh, I'm currently in Ahmedabad. I'm uh, one of the. Uh, uh, examinees for the upcoming FRCS. Great. Okay. Cool. So um, you're doing the FRCS International, all of you. We are. Okay. So you've got a, now a larger tumor that's eight centimeters. He's a young, thirty-year-old male. It doesn't matter what you think the diagnosis is. What is your approach to a large lesion? So tell me now. So the patient's sitting. I'm your patient now. I'm sitting next to you. Talk to me. Right. Uh, so, Dr. Mesrin, as uh, uh, we know that your lesion is uh, large, it's a large lesion, and uh, we'll need to uh, go in and do an incisional biopsy. Incisional biopsy would mean that we will take a part of the tumor out for the study sex, and uh, we'll uh, examine how, uh, what comes up in the histopathology. If uh, it's a malignant lesion, we'll need to go back in and take the whole tumor out with wider margins. Uh, uh, doctor, how, how are you going to cut cut and take the biopsy, doctor? Right. Um, we will plan the uh, biopsy along the lines of uh, uh, the, uh, along the lines of the tumor itself um, so that in future if we need to take a bigger margin out, the same will be delivered in the next uh, in the uh, subsequent specimen too. Okay, I'm going to stop you there. The, the two components to the FR6 exam it's how you talk to the patient and then how you address the examiner's question. They want to know, when you talk to me now, I'm, I really, because you're talking medical terms to me, all right? It's very important you say, okay, Mr. Mitran, right now you have a tumor over here because I don't know where you're taking the exam. Is it in the UK? You know, so you, you also have to know where you take the exam and what the culture is over there. Very important to understand this. So the, Mr. Mitran, you've got a tumor over here. Right now, because they'll say, talk to the patient and explain to the patient. Right now, I'm going to make a cut over the biggest, the most bumpiest area on your skin. I'm going to cut down the, the, the fat and the muscle. I'm going to get to the bone. 
what I'm going to do is, sir, is I'm going to tell me. I'm uh, I'm going to uh, raise a uh, uh, raise a flap and take out a sufficient chunk of tissue. Uh, where are you taking the chunk of tissue from? Uh, we get down uh, into the core of the tissue, not just the superficial part. Thank you. That's what I want to hear. So you tell them and explain it in simple English to them. What I'm going to do is, sir, uh, there's your bone over here. The bone has an outer layer and an inner layer, sir. I'm going to bite the outer layer. And I'm also going to go take tissue from the inner layer, sir. And then I'm going to send it to a lab. I'm going to close you up. Okay? On the right. Uh, yeah. Harish, I'm going to step in just for one second. One question I want to ask Andre. Yeah. Andre, you're in theater. You've taken the specimen. Is there a role of frozen section in rib tumors? So if the preoperative diagnosis is not made uh, and it's available, we can send for a frozen section. You would send for a frozen section? Anybody wants to tell me what is a problem with doing a frozen section on a rib tumor. Anybody can take it. All four of you who are exam going, Arif, you can take it. What is the problem of doing a frozen section? Why can you not do a frozen section in a rib tumor? Anybody? Uh, uh, sir, is it uh, because the frozen section cannot distinguish the invasiveness of a rib tumor? Uh, it just gives uh, uh, the diagnosis of a neoplasm without giving any characterization which will help in the further excision of the tumor. Even before that, the problem with doing a frozen section in a rib tumor is that the dermatome, uh, sorry, is that the, the knife of the frozen section cannot cut through a hard rib. In fact, in histology, whenever they are doing a histology of a rib lesion, they actually have to decalcify the rib for about 48 hours minimum. And so that's why you will see that the histology of a rib lesion is always delayed because the first 48 hours is to decalcify. Otherwise the knife of that machine of the frozen section will just become blunt. So you cannot do a frozen section in a rib tumor or a bone tumor is because you need to decalcify the bone before you can get the thin tissues. Okay, so that's why you have to send for formal histology. So this is coming back to the same thing. Why in, in theory or why in practice that even when we always do uh, an incisional biopsy, we always tell you watch for the tracts and everything. Why? Because we never rely on frozen. We're always going to come back and do surgery. Do, do you understand? So you need to correlate that very clearly. The answer is there. Incisional biopsy, don't forget your tract. So it means that we never rely on frozen for bone. Okay? Right. Okay, great. So, uh, so now that you found out, you've, you've done the biopsy, it's, a, it's a, uh, osteosarcoma. So can you describe your resection techniques to me? Right, so we'll have to counsel the patient that uh, the, the report has come back as malignant and uh, we need to go in again. I'll emphasize the need for a wide excision with uh, larger margins. It'll be uh, four centimeters or more on both sides, and a lot of uh, rib and chest wall chest muscles will also need to come out. So I'll pray operatively. Okay, I want to stop you there. You got to talk like you know what you're doing. Although you know what you're doing, you got to vocalize like you know what you're doing. Very simple. You just follow my exact words, okay? I will do a white local end block white local excision, which will include four centimeter uh, centimeters uh, medial and lateral. I will excise the rib above and the rib below, and I will perform any other end block resection if any other tissue below is involved and above. So it's a wide local resection. Okay, so you just use that. It took took seven seconds to explain your time, and you're clear. The examiner will go okay. He won't even ask you any more question. Okay. Now, what happens if this tumor is close to the sternum? It's at the costal control junction. What will you perform? What would you do? So we need uh, clear margins are uh, the mainstay. Uh, there is no role of uh, uh, microscopically uh, positive margin. Uh, so uh, the, that needs to come off. But at the same time, we need a 
prosthesis? No, 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 I said it's close to the sternum. What is your resection approach and technique? What operation are you going to perform? So it's very important is to listen to the question. Sometimes in examination, we're all panicky. I've been there. Very important is to listen. When you ask uh, one time, sir, can you tell me? And then if you don't understand what they're asking, they get irritable. So very important is listen to the question and answer directly. So go, shoot. So the, the, the examiner is going to go, now the tumor is situated in the anterior of the chest of the sixth rib. It's very close to the, the sternocostal junction. How, what is your surgical approach and what are you going to do? Uh, we'll, we'll need to, uh, I'll extend the incision and uh, uh, take off uh, an area of the sternum too. No, what does that mean? Remember, you always go back to your basics. I need four centimeters medial. I need four centimeters lateral. Unless there's a big, uh, you know, 100 kilo guy who's eight feet tall, most sternums are three to four centimeters wide. So what are you going to do? Uh, the the sternum will have to, that, that part of the, uh, to get the clear, clear margins of four centimeters, uh, part of the sternum uh, will have to go. And part? Yes, sir. Part? Are you sure? I said it's very close to the, it's at a, it's at a sternocostal junction. Part so, or on? Oh, part. Let's just say this is a, a, a Chondrosarcoma is exactly coming from the cartilage of the of the the sternocostal junction. Uh, so again, go back to basics. Four centimeters. Understand, you're a surgeon. You've done your cardiothoracic. You've done many synotomies. Most of the time, the sternum is three to four centimeters wide. You need that four centimeter margin. So, what are you going to do? So you're going to do a, stenec a partial stenectomy from the fifth, because it's a six rib tumor, from the fifth rib above to below. You may need to even resect the xiphoid process looking at the CT scan. And you even will resect the costal cartilage on the opposite side. Okay? Don't be worried about saying stenectomy. It's okay. You need margin. So where are you going to go to find the margin? You take out the sternum, right? You don't see if margin because sternum can always be reconstructed. So don't have fear in cu cutting things up. Okay, so I will perform again. I'll stress again. If the tumor is on the sixth rib at the sternocostal junction, I will perform a wide local excision, which will include a stenectomy from below the, uh, I'll resect the fifth rib above the seventh rib below, and then a stenectomy starting from the fifth rib down to the xiphoid process and even if the margin is more than four if it's less than four centimeters i will take the costal control junction at the fifth sixth and seventh space and i'll reconstruct it either with a mesh or i'll reconstruct it with the matrix or with the uh, uh, osteosynthesis plate with titanium plates. you see what i'm getting at right right sir yeah okay okay uh just to twist it a little bit because this probably won't come to exam because they'll just move on to the next patient now. But I'm just telling you now as a surgeon now, as a thinking surgeon, you're going to cut a very big defect. You know the sternum is going to be involved and your plastic surgeon goes, I want a tram flap. What's the, what's the blood supply of the tram flap? Amol, do you want to take this? Is Vikas not online? He was earlier. Okay, yeah, well, come on, come on and take it. Uh, sir, uh, inferior epigastric artery. No, that's not the main supply. Where's the main supply coming from? Where's inferior epigastric? Where's your main supply of your tramp up coming from? Uh, sir, from the uh, uh, 
Ilya Cartridge and uh, uh, Ilya Cartridge, sir. So, so I, you know, maybe I, I've been out of practice. I, I know, uh, but IMA is something you have to preserve because what transverse is all the way through. It supplies that your tram flap is that you need to preserve IMA. If you cut the IMA, your tram flap will die. Okay, your yes, pedicle tram flap will die. If you're doing pedicle. They, they do a free flap is a different story. Okay, but you always need to preserve the IMA because the, the blood supply to the tram flap comes from your IMA. Now, unless something has changed, uh, yes. I don't know. <laughs> Am I uh, right or wrong? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, please. Uh, because that's what I do, what we do here is we have to preserve the IMA for them. So very important when you're doing a synectomy, you can talk about after you you can cut everything out, be brilliant. How are you gonna close the defect? Your plastic surgeons, and if they need the IME preserve and the tumor is superficial on top, then you need to take the IME down. Yes, sir. Or at least preserve one side. You can take the right left. You can do a partial in the midline or what have you. But uh, yes, you got it. this just uh, you, this is not an exam question, uh, but it's something that you need to think about because you will encounter this and and talk to your plastic surgeons. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, so uh, reconstruction, we just talked about that. Follow up. Now, this is the most important thing. So you've done the surgery, patient's great, went back home. All right, and uh, when are you going to see him or her? Vinita, take this question, please. And tell Sorry. me the, the reason for your follow up. Sir, initially, uh, immediately after the start, I would to see the patient after two weeks to see the condition of the wound healing. Very good. Okay. And then uh, after a month. Now, what, then, what's the basis? So, we, even I do, you know, this is even a fault of mine. They say two weeks, six weeks, three months, six, six months, then yearly after that, or every six months after that for the first five years. So what is the evidence and the basis behind it? Do you know? So is, is it just common practice? Have you ever asked your senior consultants and stuff? Is so for lung, lung cancer, I can give you clear evidence. So it's a base, basic thing. We know, we know the five-year survival is based on, the, on our uh, uh, the latest eight staging. <coughs> we know the recurrence for stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four uh, and stuff. So I, I have a practice of the first two years seeing them with uh, chest x-ray every four months and on the uh, on the anniversary of the operation, that means every once a year I do a CT scan, right? However, I'm see when you come for FRCS exam, I don't know the answer. Neither does the examiner know the answer. He wants to know how you are thinking and why you're doing it. Because my answer is probably wrong, and I'm probably doing my own thing, and he is probably doing the same own thing. But he wants to know: Can I take you as a colleague to debate with you and say, "Hey, why not? Should I or can I learn from you today?" You understand? FRCS is no more an MBBS exam. It's you are a consultant and we're going to be colleagues. I want to know what you think and can you debate it out with me? There's no right, there's right and there's wrong answer, but there's sometimes if you talk about mitral valve replacement in a, do you, do you replace in a post-CABG patient with mitral valve? Do you need to re actually repair the mitral valve or repair, uh, change the mitral valve in a moderate failure? You need to debate this out. Because some patients will do it, some patients replace the valve, some patients repair, some patients, uh, some patients won't do anything. FRCS exam is we need, there's no right or wrong answer. You debate and justify your answer. That's all. So I'm asking you now as a fellow consultant, how do you follow your patients up? Sir, uh, uh, first follow-up is of course for the, to check the integrity of the wound and healing, wound healing. Okay, that's two weeks. weeks. Okay, great. Then after that? After that, see after one month. Why uh, one again, month? One month again to see whether the wound has healed completely, okay. and then, uh, and. Uh, so you, you just come to a clinic and you just palpate and say, "Okay, go home," or do you do any investigation? I I will do a chest X-ray. Okay, why you do a chest X-ray? Yes. Uh, so to see the. Uh, no, see. you gotta tell me what you do. I'm asking you as a fellow colleague. What do you practice and why do you do a chest x-ray? There's no right or wrong answer. You, see, you must understand, uh, to pass FRSS exam, don't go there thinking I'm here to answer questions. Go there telling them I'm a consultant, I'm going to tell you what I do. 
of course, you need to have a proper thing, but now it's an open question. Because I'm going to ask you, why do you do a chest x-ray? So I, I, for me, I actually do what you do. I do a chest x-ray, but there's a reason why I do it, because I want to see this reactive effusion again. Is it yes. building up? Are there shortness of breath? Is, is the, my flap over here becoming more opaque? Is there a seroma buildup? If there is becoming more opaque, I will then get a CT scan. There's a reason for every step I do. Not anyhow, uh, my boss said x-ray or the x-ray looks okay, go home. Then no point doing x-ray, right? Yes. So, so you need to, this is what I mean about uh, FRCS exam. You see. Okay. To pass the exam, go in there thinking that you're already a consultant. I'm going to tell you what I practice with guidelines. Then you're clear. So, yeah. X-ray is to uh, look for any collections, for lung, underlying lung collapse. Niseroma collection around the reconstructed uh, flap. Okay, so you you that's why is that why you do an X-ray? I mean, I'm asking you not not, not an exam question. I'm just yes. ask personally that that's why you're looking for it. So you you were keeping that in mind uh, why you did the X-ray, is that right? Yes. Okay, so then after one month, patient every X-ray looks perfect, pristine. Patient goes home and says, "Okay, what do I do, doctor?" We'll see you after three months. Okay, and then what? They come to your clinic, and then what does he do after that? I would, I would like to see a CT after at the third month. You do a CT scan. Why you do a CT? So this is an osteosarc, right? We said. Uh, so why you do a CT scan after three months? The CT scan to look at the uh, edges of resection, whether there are any new growths or uh, uh, or any other deposits, or whether any new growths in the uh, thorax. So, uh, Dr. Ali, correct me if I'm wrong, but there'll be a lot of tissue reaction here, yes. and you will not be able to distinguish from a CT scan after three months if there's a new small tumor growth or not. This is, uh, examiners will throw this question back to you. And what are you going to say? Anybody want to help out or want to agree or disagree with her? Yes. Uh, sir, I'm only here, sir. This is a safe place. Just argue. This is yeah, quite argue. Yeah. Your I understand. Yeah. There's no I'm right or wrong answer here. You just I want to know whether you can you can just defend your position because you're a consultant in India. I, there's nothing you do in my practice. I want to know. Can you? What you're doing is the right thing or wrong thing or anyhow doing you know. Very important that, and that's what we want to know in FRCS exam, or what I've seen at least from the examiner's point of view. I'm, I'm not an examiner, but I've sat in many exams, so. Come on. Uh, sir, first I would like to follow up the histology report, uh, the specimen which we have sent for histopathology, uh, uh, about the margins, whether they are negative or positive. And very, nice. Thing, very nice answer, good. And second thing, uh, uh, more than CT scan, I would like to do a PET scan if I am uh, having doubts of recurrence, uh, so that it can uh, uh, not not before three months, uh, after three months, because the reaction uh, uh, after surgery will settle down usually after six weeks. Uh, okay, uh, debatable, but I agree with you. Okay, at least you told me that there's a lot of reaction and the PET will light up. Okay, good. So I know you know what you're doing. Okay, All right. And uh, after that, I'll follow up the patient uh, every six months to uh, ask, him, ask him his symptoms of any pain or uh, any breathlessness. And uh, I'll see the local uh, operation site for any uh, swelling which might uh, suggest me the recurrence. And uh, chest x-ray to see pulmonary metastasis which might occur. And if uh, anything is suggestive of metastasis, then I would like to do a PET scan. Very nice. So my oncologist does a CT scan every six months for the first two years. Uh, what's the basis? They tell me because they said evidence shows that recurrence in the first five years come back about 40 to 50 percent. That's their quoting value again of the, the numbers. Uh, the China study said 78 percent survival at five years. So they do that. So uh, yeah, yes. I disagree with you. Um, you can do that. Dr. Ali, are you a practice? Yeah, I, I agree with the, what what uh, you're suggesting. I'm okay with that. I usually would do a I, either a CT scan, usually a PET scan, and then I'd follow up every six months, and then once a year for five years at least. 
Okay, uh, brilliant. So I'm going to just going to show you. Uh, do we have time? Uh, are we? Uh, we're okay with time. I'm. I'm assuming everybody's okay with time. Is that okay? okay? So I came back to the question about that painless gentleman, and um, this is the lesion. Okay, so always think again. Don't worry about. Someone says, look at this scan. Oh, this is fibrous displeasure. It's osteochondroma. This can be chondroma. We don't want to know that. And I think a lot of the examiners also probably, if you ask the examiners, uh, give me 20 different diagnoses, they'll probably stop at four. <laughs> right? But in reality, they just want to know how do you tackle these patients. So we went through the 30-year-old gentleman. So now we go through the 40-year-old um, female. She had a... Uh, previous history of some uh, brain tumor. Yeah, I'll just jump back. Okay, so I'm going to just stop at one. Okay. Now just imagine this is the, hypothetically, this is the fourth rib. This is the fifth rib, this is the sixth rib. Uh, they're gonna show you the CT scan, they're gonna give you the scan and you're gonna scroll up and down. Now, examination technique is very clear. Don't go down, up, down again and up again. You will bore people and they will, examiners will get distracted. Actually, got, it the examiner when you keep going up and down, up and down, Dr. Yeah. Yeah, so what you want to do is you want to scroll down slowly, then you scroll up, and then you stop. Or you can give a live, uh, uh, um, what's the word, uh, live talking, basically. So I'm going to just freeze frame here, and someone give it a shot. So I'm going to say this is the fourth rip, this is the fifth rip, this is the sixth rip. Someone shoot. Uh, this is a practical examination. Okay. Is very important. I'm yeah, Arif, do you want to take it? Are you feeling happy to take it? Uh, hello, sir. My name is Dr. Arif. Uh, I'm from Arjigar, Kolkata. Hi. Uh, uh, so this is a CT scan, mid external view, uh, mid external view of uh, my of a fertile female, uh, showing a, a homogeneous uh, opacity in the left hemithorax, uh, involving probably the fourth, fifth, sixth rib. Uh, the origin seems to be from the chest wall, not from the lung parenchyma. So you committed very quickly to that answer. And uh, this is where people get trapped. Okay, so as much as we want to show we are good because you talk about acute and, and uh, acute angles and uh, uh, angles. Now I'm going to ask you, why did you say this is coming from the, not chest wall, can you explain that to me? So we accidentally dig our grave giving a diagnosis, I asked you to describe, I didn't ask you to give me a uh, diagnosis. So this is the uh, mistake where most of our uh, residents make. You may they say, I want to look smart, let's go for it. But actually you dig your grave instead. Describe the scan, don't give me a decision. Go. Yes, uh, uh, this is a left-sided uh, homogeneous opacity. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, uh, of the chest in the uh, visible in the mediastinal yes. window, uh, yes, uh, involving the pleura and the ribs. Uh, okay, size so I'll, I'll, I will teach you exam technique. Okay, this is the mediastinal window of um, Miss X Y Z. Okay, there's a large homogeneous opacity. Looks like it's appearing to invade the fourth rib. There is some, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's close to the fifth rib, but I'm not sure if it's invading because I can see a fat plate here, the sixth rib. The lesion appears to come from the chest wall and pushing into the pleural space. And why do I mention that? It's because the pectoralis major is external and it looks like it's not involving the pectoralis major muscle, okay? So this I feel, and you can correct me because I may be wrong. This I feel is a tumor of the chest wall Okay, and it's between the fourth and fifth in the costal space. Stop there. Don't say what you think it is. Don't say whatever. Don't say it's a plural lesion or stuff. And you can just say, 
I feel it's coming from the chest wall, full stop. Now he's going to ask you, why do you, are you sure it's from the chest wall and not the pleura? And then you can describe acute and chronic angles. Right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So don't dive into an answer. You just describe the lesion. Just describe the lesion, describe the lesion. Stop and stop there and wait for the next question. Okay. So they go, okay. Uh, thank you, sir. I think uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good observation. We're not going to ask you what you think it is, but this patient has a history of uh, a brain tumor called hemangioparasitoma. Now, when I looked at the history myself, I thought, wow, uh, you know, how can a hemangioparasitoma go here? So what's your next option? Now, what would your patient be thinking in your clinic? In front of you, the scan is here. Talk to me like your patient. Uh, uh, madam, uh, you have a, uh, I have some news for you. Uh, on your CT scan, I have found uh, that there is a, a homogeneous opacity on the left, in the left side of your uh, chest I, inside. Oh, you're talking to your patient. What is homogeneous opacity to yes, a patient? Sir. There yeah. is a growth. Yes, sir. Exam technique, very important. There is a growth on the left side of your chest involving the fourth and fifth rib, or it's close to the fourth and fifth rib. Okay, yeah. start with that. Go again. Uh, hello, madam. I have some news for you. Uh, I have been seeing your CT scan reports, and I, there is a growth uh, uh, present inside your chest. Uh, it seems to be involving the fourth, uh, fifth, uh, fourth rib, uh, adjacent to the fifth and sixth rib. Uh, I'm not sure about the histology, and since uh, you already had uh, a brain tumor, uh, I think uh, uh, I would like to get an opinion of a. I'd like to first uh, get an opinion of a, a neurologist or a neurosurgeon. Uh, uh, but if they permit, referred you the case. He's following up the patient. Why do you want to get a neurosurgeon? Sorry, I forgot to mention that neurosurgeon referred you this case. So sorry. Uh, Okay, if the neurosurgeon has referred it, then uh, uh, then we would like to obtain a histo uh, histological diagnosis. So uh, I'd like to uh, subject you so to a some... times, the Sir? Indian surgeons or residents fail the FRCS, and I'll be very honest with you, is not because of their lack of their knowledge. It's a <coughs> lack of presentation skills. All right? What you need to say is, you don't say, Sir, I want to get histological diagnosis and I'm going to do it. No, you talk like you're talking to the patient. There is a growth on the left side of your chest. It is involving the rib. You've got a history of a brain tumor before. I am concerned if this is a tumor from the brain or something new. What I would like to do is I would like to get some tissue from this growth and then figure out what to do next. Yes. So imagine this is a Western patient coming here and, and you're talking to me, uh, uh, sir, I'm going to get histological diagnosis. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. They get, they lose that. And, and that's why FRSS examiners, it's not about your knowledge. Very important. You guys got to notice. You guys have wide knowledge much more than a lot more people. What is presentation? You got to practice on that. Keep talking and practice. Uh, Dr. Ali, am I right? Uh, yeah, absolutely right, actually. Yeah. So, so go back. Go back now. You're coming to talk about the growth there. And what are you going to do next? Uh, so, madam, uh, I'd like to take a, a few uh, bits of tissue uh, from the uh, from the mass. If, uh, if Very you consent. Nice. How are you going to do it? Uh, uh, there are uh, a couple of methods. Uh, you could, first, okay, you could... So, uh, so patient's away now. Now I'm examiner. Uh, so what's your approach, sir? Uh, sir, I'd like to take a, a core biopsy. Uh, after uh, local anesthesia, I'd like to make a small uh, uh, local anesthesia and infiltration. I'd like to take a, a core biopsy so that uh, we can get adequate specimen. And how, how, how are you going to do the core biopsy? Uh, sir, we'll uh, stick a needle, a whiteboard needle inside. So that's I know. Get... That's how everyone does a core biopsy. How are you going to do the core biopsy? What's your guide? Uh, it's a CT guided. Are we doing it CT guided, yes. I will perform or I will order a CT guided biopsy, a core biopsy for this patient. Stop. You understand? Keep it simple, keep it short. So how are you going to get the diagnosis? 
Sir, I will order a CT core biopsy for his patient. Finish. If I answer this question, he's going to move on. Now he's going to tackle you. Maybe he wants to challenge you and go, oh, you know what? I don't want to do a CT core biopsy. I want to take this tumor out straight away. Should we do it? Yes, sir. Since the, it appears to be a 3 by 4 uh, centimeter uh, tumor, we could uh, take out the entire tumor, excisional biopsy, and we'll have a larger tissue to sample and uh, achieve, uh, arrive at the diagnosis. Yes, we can go. That will be my... If the, if the core, but core biopsy will be less invasive, so I think... Uh, you see, you, FRCS exam, I keep on stressing, is you as a consultant not being twisted with your decisions. An examiner is going to say, well, you know, I want to take it out. They want to know, can you make a decision as a day one consultant? Know that. So if it was me, I'll say, no, sir. I will want to get a biopsy first. Because I think this tumor is very big. It involves massive resection, the fourth, fifth, and maybe sixth rib. And chest wall reconstruction. I don't want to put it through that. What if this is something else altogether? What if hemangioparicytoma can be treated with chemotherapy? Which is probably not right, but I, you need to defend. Dr. Khan, can you help me out, please? That's a very, very valid and important point. I want this message to go home, that sometimes the examiner actually tries to lead you down the wrong path. If you've made a decision to do a CT-guided core biopsy, just stick with it, because you, you can say that, you know what? I need to know the histology before I'll operate on the patient. And that's it. And there's nothing wrong with that. So the examiner may say, I want to operate this. You just say, no, I think I would still want a preoperative diagnosis before I get into the chest. As long as you're confident of what you've done, actually you will get plus points for these sort of things. Don't so, get misled by the examiner. That's quite important. But don't argue with the examiner as well. Don't yeah. be adamant. If he comes back to you and say, no, no, but I think we should excise it, then yes, sir. <laughs> you know, but he does uh, agree. Sir. I think that's another option. <laughs> that is another option that we could follow. So you choose your words carefully, but stand your ground by the same token. If you're confident about what you're saying, I, I completely agree. A CT guided core biopsy is the answer. Okay, let's move along. We've got three more cases and then uh, we, we're going to call it a wrap. Uh, so here's one more. Oh, sorry. Okay. Young 22-year-old girl going to high school, just, uh, sorry, going to university, just finished, got a degree, starting her job. She said that she's always had this lump there for, since she was like 12 years old. And, uh, you know, she says it's getting bigger, but not so obvious. And uh, took an x-ray, and this is the x-ray, uh, X-ray came out as a lesion there. We got a CT scan done for her. So she's sitting in your clinic right now. Who wants to take it through? Okay, who, who wants to take it? Andre, do you want to take it next? This is at the uh, ninth rib, if I'm not mistaken. The ninth rib, uh, it's fairly large because it extends quite, quite, a, quite deep and it's going into the peritoneum. That, that down to the kidney <coughs> peritoneum here. So, so now I'm going to be uh, uh, more in a theoretical point of view. 22 years old, large tumor. Uh, been there for a long time though, from the history. What are you concerned about? What, what's running through your mind right now? Anybody wants to go for... Uh, can it be benign? Can it be so, so, so run it through me. What's going through your mind when you work? Because this is the same thing that goes through my mind. Is this benign? Is this malignant? If it's benign, what is it? If it's malignant, what is it? So now we're going to go some bit of theory. So uh, Since it's been uh, there for some time and it's uh, well contained uh, within the rib, uh, and uh, so the, by process, uh, it appears to be a uh, benign tumor arising from the rib. You, you feel it's a benign tumor. Why? It's... Uh, because it's been there for uh, at least uh, 10 years. Okay, yeah, okay, 10 years. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, okay. And it is, uh, an, uh, uh, it, is it, uh, it seems to be contained within uh, the rib cortex. Very nice, okay. And I don't see uh, infiltration into fat planes. And, uh, 
Back Wait, so can I can, can I now argue you and say I think uh, this thing's malignant? So can you give me some debate about why it's not malignant? I, I know you gave me some positive points. Why do you think now it's probably not malignant or it could be malignant? What's a, what are some views that it may be malignant? Uh, from from demographics, from age wise, from gender, from you know, uh, throw it in there. Throw it in there as, as just the, this is theoretical knowledge as so. well. Okay, okay, I'll throw it in. Can it be a chondro sarcoma? Yes, it can be. Uh, oh, stop. Where is this lesion? Where, where, the, where does chondro sarcoma come from? It's in the rib. It comes from the chondro sarcoma, yeah. comes from the uh, cartilage cap. Yes, yeah, so is that cartilage in the middle of the rib? Uh, no, there is a, the cancer of chondrocytoma. Like, you opt into it. I, I love this discussion. You actually <laughs> fell for it. Who client yeah. thinker? Yeah. So you, I, I'm, I'm throwing you. This is not probably. This is not how the exam works. But I want you to be a thinking surgeon and not just a guy who just chops things up. All right. You need to be a thinking surgeon to process things very, very clearly. So you gotta go. Okay. Rule out chondrocytoma. Can it be osteosarc? Give me some points why this can be osteosarc or why it cannot be osteosarc. Uh, typical osteosarcoma lesion would have a, a, a sunburst appearance and the cortex being lifted off. Whereas here we see complete expansion of the medullary cavity with thinning of the cortex. As if Very nice. Okay, cool. Uh, by model distribution wise, can fit in. Lah. Okay, so that's only one, one point. Okay, good. And then slow growing tumor. Now, can this be a fibrous dysplasia of the bone? Nine. Can it be uh, uh, um, even sarcoma? No. Why not? Uh, uh, the, uh, we don't have the uh, onion peel appearance, and uh, it's not a young male with constitutional symptoms like fever. At least not nice. Nice. Although, like you said, you cannot be 100%, but I like, is this how you debate in your head? Is what consultants think through in your head, okay? Good, that's what I want. Okay. Now, how are you going to tackle her? She's sitting here. Can I just put in a small point? Go for it, yeah. None of you asked for any further views or any other investigations before I talk about these tumors. Is there any other views you want to see or is there any other investigation within the CT domain that you want to see, which will help you with your diagnosis? Because that's what you would do in a clinic, isn't it? You won't just look at a, you know, sagittal section, you will see a coronal section. You see a lateral, you see. So none of you asked the examiner whether, can I see another view? See, this is the, your, I, I all of that, Dr. Ali is bringing up stuff that I, even I'm not thinking about. So you see, it's good. This is why this interaction is brilliant. So uh, I want to know his answer. So what, what, what is he thinking? I, I want to see the coronal view. And more importantly, I also want to see a 3D reconstruction of the city. Yeah. I want to see a 3D reconstruction of the ribs to see the rib in its totality from the neck to the cartilage. So that's what I, before I make any diagnosis, I want to see the rib in its total. And I would ask the examiner, would you please show me a 3D reconstruction? And if he says, no, this is what you got, then you start talking as you're talking. But I, I would ask a different view and I would ask a lateral view and I would want to see uh, a 3D reconstruction because that will help you making up the diagnosis. Whether is it localized to just one area or is it involving the entire rib? Because this view is not the best view to see the whole rib. Here you're only seeing a cut section of the rib. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Dr. Khan. And uh, I didn't think of that when I, uh, uh, when I put this scan up. But, um, no, but that's what you would do in your clinic, isn't it? When you see this yeah, picture, I mean, you we would look, look, look at everything. You know? And look at it in its totality. Because at this moment, you can't even count the ribs on that one shot. You don't even know if it's the fifth, sixth, seventh rib. True, I, I, but I just did mention it was nine trip, so. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, sorry, it's just I'm trying to help these guys. I totally agree. I, I'm, I, not, I'm not criticizing your uh, teaching. This is why, this is why you have this debate is good because when yeah. you get a very senior surgeon, Dr. Ali, I even learned from this, this thing that you need to comment and you need to screen through everything. Because when I put this up as an, uh, just a question for everybody, I didn't think what he would ask me this question. 
So this is what examiners do. You don't know what they're actually thinking and asking. They want to know, can you think like a consultant? And when he asked that question, and that's when I suddenly went, oh yeah, you're right. Now he's got a very big point. You need to do a 3D recon. You see a coronal view. You see a sagittal view. I would ask for these things. So you need to think. Again, I will stress to you, FRC's exam is not MBBS exam. FRC's exam is day one consultant. He wants to know if how you think like a consultant. Just for that last case, Arif, you said this is coming from the chest wall and not from the lung. And I would have asked the examiner, can I please see the lung window? What you okay. see in the lung window is a different view as compared to a mediastinal. He showed you only a mediastinal window. He did not show you a lung window. So how can you comment whether it's coming from the lung or not? Yeah. Okay, so carry on. Uh, Okay, so, so I, again, we, we're going to reenact the same scenario over and over. That's what I do, and this is how uh, got my, my residents pass exam. We do it over and over, same, same, you stick to the same concept, but different situations. Patient is sitting in front of you now, what are you going to advise the patient? Vinita, come on. Change the speaker. Vinita, come on board. Yes, sir. yes. Sir. So, uh, okay. So, uh, hello, I'm Dr. Vinita. So, uh, we have seen, I've seen this uh, CT scan of yours and uh, we have, uh, there is a mass lesion in on the left side of your ninth rib. So, we need to know more about it. Uh, so, uh, with okay. first plan. I'm going to stop here. I want to teach you, and it's what I do when I teach you, uh, ma'am, sir, uh, whatever. There is a growth in your ninth rib. Don't say that a mess. Use simple words when you're communicating with patients. Okay. Then when you turn around and talk to the doctor, you talk differently. We talk to, because we want to see your interaction. There is a growth on your ninth rib. Okay, go on. Sorry. Okay. Okay, madam. There is a there is a growth on the uh, on your left side, ninth rib. So we would like to get more about it before going to the further decisions. So I would like to take a uh, biopsy from the, from the growth to know what it is exactly and then plan the further management. So we would uh, plan a CT guided uh, bone biopsy for this under radiological guidance. A radiologist will proceed with a, a small, in, introducing a small needle after uh, giving local anesthesia and they will get a biopsy uh, tissue from this uh, growth and then we will have a final histology then we will plan the further treatment. Perfect. So patient goes for very good biopsy comes back inconclusive. Okay, so now we have the CT guided code biopsy telling it's inconclusive. That means the tissue which was obtained by the radiologist and the guidance was uh, not adequate to get to a, a final histology. So I think we need to get more uh, specimen on this. So what I would suggest is that uh, we will go for a, a incisional biopsy because it's a large mass. So we will plan for an operative procedure wherein I will put a small incision over the small uh, incision over this uh, the most prominent part of your mass after giving an local anesthesia. And then I will get in, uh, open the cortex and get into the deeper tissue and get some more bio, uh, tissue so that we can get a definitive histology uh, which will help us to plan further. Wonderful. That's exactly what I did. So very important is that you commit your decision because the core biopsy came out negative. Patient now is uh, what we call very anxious. Oh, are you going to submit another one? Then what are you going to do again? What are you going to do again? And you, you explain it very nicely. You said before we initiate any big surgery, let's get a core biopsy and go in. I like that. I'm saying you stuck to the guidelines. Perfect. Now it came out as a osteochondroma. Osteochondroma. So yes, uh, we have the final histology in our hand. It is. It says it's a benign lesion, osteochondroma. But since it is large, uh, it it is better to excise it. So uh, since it is a benign lesion, you need not worry. We can excise this rib with two centimeter margin around, and we'll plan a surgery for that. And we'll uh, we will after anesthesia, we will then uh, incision along the line of the uh, mass, including the previous. Uh, Stop. So now that it's an osteochondroma, I will plan an excision. Uh, I will excise the tumor with a two centimeter margin Much. and primary close. Finish. Yes. Yes. So, on to the next question. 
or another patient. Because if you spend too much time, okay. you wasted your time. Okay? Okay. Yes. I'm going to give you now scenarios. Uh, maybe they may move to the next patient. Maybe they'll come back in. You've done the incision. You're excising it. This thing now is stuck to the diaphragm. What are you going to do? Yeah. Well, that's been I would like to take this portion of the diaphragm which is stuck to it and uh, primarily close it. So I would uh, I would take those that portion of the diaphragm which is so stuck to it and then close the diaphragmatic defect. And how would you close the diaphragmatic defect? Can if it is a small portion, you can close it primarily with proline. And what if it's a big portion? If I need to excise a bigger portion to completely excise this mass, I will rip, uh, I will reconstruct the mesh. And what mesh would you use? Proline mesh, sir. Proline mesh. Okay, nice. Very nicely said. Very nicely done. Good. Very good. Thanks. Okay. Uh, anybody else has any questions about this patient? Okay. Yes, sir, uh, after exercising the rib, won't we be uh, constructing, reconstructing the. Do we have to tell that also, or do you wait for the question? Do you uh, wait for this? Uh, Generally, they won't ask because we already, or at least the examiner will assume that you won't reconstruct a single rib resection. But uh, if they ask you, would you reconstruct it? They say no. Say single rib and lower down ninth rib doesn't play part in respiration. Okay. Generally, when you reconstruct uh, ribs, uh, again, you stick to the, the rule of five centimeter defect, the posterior rib stuff. But if you want to reconstruct ribs for respiration control, uh, it's four to nine. Four to nine takes part in a mesh. <laughs> One, two, three doesn't play much role, and, and uh, 10, 11, 12 don't play any role in your breathing. So, if you want to talk about and you want to defend your answer for reconstructing, then you stick to the four to nine rule for respiration. If it's a single rib and it's a large mass uh, coming out, then sometimes on table you ask the anesthetist to reinflate the lung particularly in the eighth or ninth rib position, you ask them to reinflate the lung. And if you feel that the lung is going to herniate through that area, then you put in a little proline mesh along that. So yeah. very rarely in a single rib with a very large, like a fibrous dysplasia, which is six or seven centimeters in size all the way along, and you've taken the whole rib out from top to bottom, you may be worried about a herniation. And so in that situation, you can think about just putting a mesh to prevent the herniation. Don't disagree. Dr. Ali, what, what do you think of uh, putting my Ethibon technique? Yeah, you can use that. You can do the Ethibon and just uh, put them together. Yeah. Uh, just make oh, a sort of a mesh. Just keep it there. Uh, yeah, the well, said, yeah, just zigzag it around so that you don't... Yeah. Uh, anything. You can do something, but think about the possibility of a lung herniation in a large mass, even though it might be a single rib. And the best way to know it is on table, you check it. And if you feel that the lung is slipping out into that space, then do something about it. I don't mind what you do. You can do the ethibond technique, you can do darning, you can do sewing, or even better, just put in a simple mesh. That's okay. Totally agree. Uh, okay, second last case before we end the night. Um, I'm going to stop here. Uh, okay, I'll scroll through the scan first. Stop there. 56 year old male, no previous medical history, completely well. Went for a medical checkup, did a chest x ray, found some uh, shadowing in the chest x ray, did a CT scan. His only history is that he's lost about 10 kilos uh, in this uh, past maybe four or five months. So, uh, someone shoot. Uh, I'm going to ask you a bit more specific. I'm going to check this one. <laughs> I want you to uh, ask, ask yes, sir. Uh, can you take, the, the examiner will be very simple. Can you take a proper history for, uh, can you take a, um, uh, a specific history for this patient if asked? We don't want to ask about uh, what your mother, father does and everything. They'll ask you very quickly, FRCS, you want to go through it fast. Can you take a specific history? Go. Hello, I am Dr. Amol and uh, 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 I would like to ask you certain questions to know more about your TCs. So please uh, uh, tell in brief whatever I ask. You've already wasted about 30 seconds of your time. I'm Dr. Amul. Can I ask you a few questions? Yes, sir. 
now go uh since when you are having this loss of weight and uh, uh, decrease in the appetite uh, this past 4 months 10 kilos do, do you have any cough or anything any any problems regarding your uh, abdomen no, no, no cough sir uh do you have any pain anywhere in the body yeah my back hurts a bit that's yes, yeah uh, Your your back is aching. Uh, since when it is? It the it does it correlate with the loss of weight? I was well before until three months ago. I I'm a builder. I build stuff. I was very well. I can drink. I can party. I just started getting backache and I started losing weight and I've lost my appetite in the past three months. Uh, do you have any weakness in your legs? Uh, any time you felt any? I'm good. And I still build. Yeah. Do you have any headaches or any uh, loss or any difference in your vision? I've actually been noticing a bit of fever of late. Okay. How is the fever? It's mild, high degree. How is how is the fever? Cold at night. I don't know if it's high or low. I just take some Panadol and I'm okay. Yeah. Uh, do you sweat during your fever after your fever? Mm, it's cold here. Yeah. Sometimes I don't know. I I turn the aircon on a lot. uh okay and uh, who who all are uh, living with you in you in your family no i i I'm live alone i'm not married i'm 56 years old uh, uh any any problem any health problems in your parents mo- mother father brothers is uh, still alive and they're kicking uh no problem at all uh i, I would like to ask certain uh, certain personal questions like do you smoke Yeah. Uh, how two many packs. cigarettes? How many cigarettes per day? Two packs a day. Okay. Uh, since when? I uh, forever. Okay. Do you do you have alcohol? I have a couple of pints every day. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Stop. So. Okay. So what you're doing is you've already failed the questionnaire because I asked you to ask for specific questions. and you're now asking me what medical students do you want to target history you asked me a few questions i i acknowledged it and now you should go to get so to cut you short i was already you already said back pain i said yes uh you asked me then now you're going on to family mother father we have no time for that for us yes we're going to go straight to the point so i gave you a hint i've lost the weight lost appetite i had night sweats i got fever stop there yes okay Thank you sir move on okay so patients in your clinic right now what are you going to do uh sir he is probably having uh, 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 uh malignant etiology uh, uh we don't know where is the primary uh, uh, and matlab maybe certain uh, uh, somewhere near the spine because he is having uh, back ache uh, we would <coughs> like to investigate it with uh, first with the x-ray and uh, PA x-ray. View, that will be Sorry, I'm going to stop you here. So, Doctor Ali, uh, yeah, you can't do an X-ray. You've already done a CT. Can I just interrupt one second, Doctor Harish? I, yeah. I, I need to catch an international flight, so I've got Doctor Nikhil sitting there with the computer. He's going to please continue with the discussion, but I just need to be excused because I need to see a couple of patients before I rush off for my flight. Is that okay? I'm so sorry to leave this discussion. It's thank you so much, Doctor Ali. It's uh, wonderful having you over. I'm going to finish up in next ten minutes anyway. So don't stop short because of me. Uh, Dr. Nikhil will take over my computer, and he will wait till the meeting ends. Okay, thank you very much, guys. And yeah, uh, thank you. Bye. This is Dr. Arish. I, I love this uh, topic. Fantastic. Well done. Okay. Cheers, very. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Hi, Dr. Nikhil. How are you? Okay, so uh, I'm going to come back. You don't need a chest X-ray when you've already got a CT scan. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. So we we would like to go back to my same examples again. Yes, sir. You've got a mass. You've got a CT scan. He's already presented to you with a thing. You said it's malignant. I agree. You suspect it's malignant. I agree. What is the next thing you're going to do? Uh, sir, we. Uh... Uh, we need to confirm it with the uh, 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 biopsy. Uh, we, I need, I want to take the biopsy and confirm uh, uh, whether it's malignant or. Uh, Very nice. Now, yes, just eyeballing it now. Okay, I completely agree with you, and I'll tell you the answer for this. 
So I agree that you want to do a biopsy. How would you perform a biopsy? Uh, sir, I would like to go ahead with a CT guided uh, uh, core, core biopsy. Core biopsy. Very yes, good. Sir. Okay. Now, just looking here, because I was there in the clinic too, what do you think is this? Because uh, I, I have probably three differentials <laughs> that are probably same as yours, but you'd be surprised at what the answer was. But anyway, go on. Uh, sir, my first, uh, uh, first differential would be uh, osteosarcoma. Okay, good. Okay, it's number two. And uh, it might be a neural tumor uh, coming and eroding the rib. Very good. Number three. And uh, okay. probably a, 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 a soft tissue tumor uh, coming from the back muscles, which might be eroding the rib and going inside. I, no, I, uh, sir, I, sir, I would like to change I, the third. My third differential would be uh, CL lung because he is a heavy smoker. Okay, but uh, doesn't okay. Well, again, not not doesn't look because CL lung journey has speculated the advance from the lung outwards. This doesn't look like very well defined margins, no? Yes, sir. C yes, sir. Lung, no, no chance. Uh, so what we all missed, including myself, was. Loss of weight, loss of appetite, fever at night. So we biopsied it, and the fever was actually B symptoms. You remember, you know that? Yes, yes sir. It's a lymphoma. Yes, it's a lymphoma. Yeah, it was a lymphoma, you know. So yes, we all did, but anyway, I would have done the same thing. I biopsied it anyway because I wouldn't have done surgery for him. And lymphoma, yes. great. You know, we gave him chemo and uh, the thing shrunk. Yes, so, uh, so we missed that. Okay, last one, last slide. 69 year old. Uh, so one of the different should. Sorry? Uh, so can I interrupt you for a moment? Sir? Sure. So uh, in the last case, one of the differential diagnoses was uh, the first one, if I heard correctly, was osteogenic sarcoma, right? Yes. So which, uh, uh, which uh, bony cortex do we see uh, giving its origin from? Ah, so okay. So uh, right? you're talking about cortex, is that it? So if you scroll, oh, okay. okay, the rib is. So basically, the the the, the transverse process was involved. See here, right. So in the transverse, the the uh, um, the, the the junction between the the costal vertebral junction was involved actually over here. Okay. And uh, if you look very very closely, it was actually eroding into the tumor over here. So All right. It's not to be a lymphoma. <laughs> so, um, okay, last case. Uh, and this will be a, probably a quick one. Okay, I'm going to stop here. 69 year old female ovarian CA lesion over here. They did a PET scan, it lights up. Tell me how would you tackle it as a thoracic surgeon? It's a pleural deposit. Good. They've done a PET scan. Nothing else lights up anywhere else in the body. And the uh, oncologist says, uh, yeah, it may be ovarian CA, may not be ovarian CA. I want to know if it's METS or not. What are you going to do? We go ahead and take a tissue biopsy for us. Sorry? Just to ensure that it's a, a metastatic disease, uh, not a, a primary there. We go ahead and take a tissue biopsy like we would uh, anywhere else. And then how would you do that tissue diagnosis? Um, well, um, uh, so we would go for a minimal invasive procedure here, a laparoscopy. La laparoscopy? This is oh. in the chest. Uh, sorry, I, I mean uh, uh, a thoracoscopic. Uh, a thoracoscopic, so you do a VATS. Yeah? Okay. So uh, you put the scope in, <coughs> you did a VATS, you push a diaphragm down, you feed this thing over there. You burn it all around it and you find out, hey, it's going deeper and deeper into the muscle layer. Are you going to just biopsy and come out or what are you going to do? <coughs> 
So this is now coming to the level of, um, I wouldn't use the word experimental surgery, but I'll use the word beyond the norms. And while we talk about pushing boundaries, and this is where we, we want to know how you think. So you, you put the scope in, you see a pro lesion, you, like, as you're like, trying to do a biopsy, you notice it's going into the intercostal space. So what are you going to do? If, uh, if we have a facility of a frozen section, we can send it for one. You, 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 you biopsy it, it's ovarian CA. Mets to the, actually it doesn't look like pleural. It looks like it's mets in the intramuscular plane. If the if the primary appears well controlled, and if there are no light ups anywhere else in the PET scan, we can uh, take it out with uh, by margin. Very good. See, there's no right or wrong answer to this because fifty percent of the search to say it's met stage four. Let's stop the give her palliative chemo. The other fifty percent of new age surgeons might turn around and say. Oh, Let's cut the ribs, let's take it out, cut the ribs, do an end block resection and take it out and you show margins. Why? Because the concept is very similar to metastectomy, right? Single lesion, uh, why do you do metastectomy? It's stage 4-2. Why is it that if this is not a plural-based lesion, it's a single plural-based lesion, why can't you apply the same concept? So papers are coming out, people are changing the, the views of things. At the end of the day, again, I'll stress again, what I feel at least, and it may not be the holy grail, FRCS exam is yes, you need to do the right thing, but you don't, you need to be able to answer your questions according to a, a consultant level. When they do cardiac surgery, cardiac surgery is one of the really nice fields that you can actually say yes or no and debate it out according to guidelines. And even if guidelines are uh, you know, state, uh, the second tier or third tier guidelines, you can still debate it and, and defend your answer. That's why FRCS exam is that, is that for you. They're not here to test you like MBBS. You, they already feel you've attained the relevant knowledge. That's why you've got, you've got access to the exam. They want to know is, can, do you deserve the qualification as a day one consultant and function like that? That's all. They're just maintaining standards for what they are doing. Right, sir. Okay? Right. <laughs> okay, sir. So I hope you guys had a good time today. Uh, it's uh, be overshot by half an hour or 40 minutes. Yes, sir. It was a very nice discussion, sir. We got a lot of uh, uh, hints about how to uh, answer in the exams. Uh, though we, though we, ha uh, we might be having the information, but uh, expressing that information in a correct way is uh, uh, equally important. It's, it's all a show and tell exams. Yes. <laughs> we, all, we already know you have the knowledge because you're already practicing surgeons. What we want to do is you, we want to show that, that you can explain it to your colleagues, to your this thing, and you want to have that trust in your colleagues that you are safe and you can handle it. So you need to practice vocalization. You need to do it with your husband, do it with your wife, do it with your friend, do it with your, your colleague. You know, practice every day. It's all about talking and it's all about not stammering and not sure. We all understand it in exams, but if you can speak fluently and well, you will always get through. And learn to defend your answer. Understand when someone asks you a question, it's not trying to put you down. It's trying to ask you, hey, can you rebut my, my question? Because your oncologist, think of it as real time, right? Your oncologist may do differently. Your respiratory physician will do differently. Your other thoracic surgeon will do differently. They want to know why should I send the patient to you? And you tell them why with a very calm, think of it that way. You're in the clinic and you got to tell them why you think it's the right thing to do. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank All right, wonderful. You, sir. Okay, so uh, with that, um, thank you, I, sir. Any thank other you, questions uh, before I uh, finish up? Uh, uh, hello, uh, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, uh, 
Now, can we use the tram flap for, for posterior defects, or uh, we have any other? Uh, um, I don't. Uh, I don't think you can. You can twist the tram to the posterior. You gotta ask your plastic surgeon there. But uh, yes, as sir. far as I know, you you can't. You can't. If you have, if we have a larger defect posteriorly, then what are the options to cover it, sir? Uh, look, if in thoracic cage, basically, from my experience, you've only got a few. You've got your pec major. Yes, sir. You've got your lat dorsi. Yes, sir. You've got your serratus anterior flap, and the biggest flap you can mobilize anteriorly, which I feel is a tram flap. I'm not sure if you can. You can probably put it to the side, but posteriorly, I think it's a bit tricky. Yes, sir. Uh, so you probably need to to free your lat dorsi and your serratus anterior flaps around and yes, sir. to close. The other option is free flap lap, but how are you gonna put a tram flap posteriorly? It's a bit tricky. You yes, you sir. need to don't don't do this by yourself if you're gonna do something like that. You gotta do it with your plastic surgeon because they know they know it better. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, guys, good night, uh, and uh, look forward to seeing you all. If you ever meet up in a conference or whatever, just come up and say hi. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Sure, thank, sir. You, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, sir. Good night, bye. Okay, good night, sir. Okay, okay, good night. Bye. Thank you, everyone, again. Thank you, Dr. Harish. Thank you, bye, guys. Bye, bye. Thank you, sir.